I continued my conversation with Howard Storm with his insights into his life as it was before his near-death experience and as he lives his life now. Sometimes, in order to understand what is light, you have to understand a little about darkness. Howard begins his insight by reflecting on those he encountered in hell, as well as what his life was like that led him there in the first place. These people who had rejected God had um, sadly, in their rejection of God, rejected everything that God gives us that we take for granted. And God gives us love, God gives us joy, God gives us light, God gives us um, hope, God gives us the creation, the world, and in their world, all those things are absent. All as they have is their existence themselves, which is what they had lived for in this world, for their own self-gratification, and, and the company of the people they were um, ended up being um, basically people seeking um, to dominate and torment one another. Evil finds God unbearable. I mean, because that, that is in fact what evil is, is uh, that which um, rebels against God. In this modern age, there is such a clear and intentional anger toward even the mentioning of Jesus. It is deemed insensitive and intolerant by a self-proclaimed tolerant and enlightened culture. When you think about it, I think rationally, why are people so offended by Jesus? You know, um, Jesus is um, arguably, but I think you can make a very convincing argument, probably the most influ influential individual that's ever lived on the face of the earth. I, I don't think it's hard to make that argument and make it convincingly. And like his whole message was about love. So why are people so hostile to him? I mean, we've got, we're talking about, and I don't mean this to be demeaning, but in a worldly sense, if, because uh, of course I believe in his divinity and he was the son of God, but put that aside for a minute, if we can, that he was, an itinerant rabbi from Galilee, not even respected by um, the Judeans, he preached love. So what, where's the offense? Who was, who was murdered by the Romans? You know, where's the offense? Why, why, why are people so hostile to him? I asked Howard about his attitudes toward Christianity before his experience. Was he antipathetic towards Christianity and faith in God, or just merely indifferent? Much of his response answers the previous question of why people are so hostile towards God in the first place. Is there really such a thing as an atheist, or is it someone who is simply terribly angry and disappointed with God? There, there was um, inside of me real hostility towards Christianity because lo looking back, I, I didn't have this kind of insight into myself at the time, but looking back, um, I wanted I wanted God. I believe that everybody in the world wants God. Um, I believe that since we have all um, originated with God and that this world is infused with God in some mysterious way that um, everybody needs, desires, craves God in their heart. But there are many people in this world who have um, become disillusioned, angry, disappointed with God for um, their own individual reasons. The way that I was in our society made me successful. And my career path since I changed has been from societal standards all downhill. For example, um, my, I think my ex-wife would be happy to tell you that I'm the biggest loser in the world. My um, income is a small fraction of what it used to be and I, I don't have any galleries showing my work. Ultimately, we make it all a lot more complicated than it needs to be. Exploring God's love in an academic sense is fine, but what Jesus wants of us and for us is very simple. We get caught up in being religiously pedantic about it all which separates us from God's original hope for us.
Jesus basically wants us to be compassionate people and to care about each other and to care for each other. That's really what he wants. He wants us to enjoy life and so much of what we judge people by is of no consequence to God whatsoever. In Kentucky, there's a saying, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go out with girls that do. Um, frankly, God could care less about that stuff. I mean, and, and if a person wants to feel self-righteous um, by that kind of um, superficial behavior, that's sin. There, you know, because self-righteousness is a way of isolating ourselves from other people. Mm. It turns them into they, and since they, they are people that we don't want to associate with, they are people that we don't want to care about. There are, in God's eyes, there are no us and them. I mean, I guess one way you could put it, we're all equally, we're all equal sinners, so get over it. And, um, you know, what can you do to a person? I think uh, St. Paul puts it very well when he says, all my works are but filthy rags before holy God. So, we're all on a loving, we're all on a loving level playing field. Um, you know, we're, we're human beings, we're very flawed beings. Let's just do the very best we can and that that is what God wants from us, is just to do the best that we can, to be as um, kind to one another as we can, to be as joyful, to be appreciative of God's creation, to, um, to um, enjoy the sunshine, enjoy the um, apple that we have the opportunity to have, to um, care for the creation and that's what God put us in this world to do. Howard has relayed his experience of life after the body's death and other strange things like life elsewhere in the universe. Talking about this with others, I have encountered a lot of self-righteous condescension by people who think they have it all figured out and find such possibilities theologically incorrect. It's shocking because those people are always religious people and why would religious people want to put limits on God's creativity? I mean, what, why, why do they have an interest on limiting God? When, if you have any appreciation of God, the more wonderful and the bigger and greater He is, the more you love Him. After Howard had his near-death experience and came back into this world, he was able to see for a short time the interaction of the invisible spiritual world interacting with the reality that we perceive. Angels do indeed exist, and they kept an eye on Howard and still do. But he was also able to see dark spiritual forces interact in our world as well. And the more I'm aware of this um, spiritual warfare in the world, the more I'm convinced that it's absolutely real and that I'm missing. The problem is, is that when you start to do good, you become a target. Um, the spiritual forces have victories. There's, there's people that they've won and they are not oppressing them. They they own them. They're, they're after people that they want to win over to their side. So as long as you're trying to um, support the cause of God, there's forces that are be, going to be up against it. Like, um, you know, when you're a kid, you know, and you find an old abandoned building, the first thing you want to do is pick up rocks and break out all the windows. I remember my friends finding an abandoned barn once a week, and we busted out every single window in the barn with rocks. I'm just like, why did we do that? Because it's in our nature, you know, it's in our nature as, you know, we, we were children and it was a bad thing to do, but it's what little boys do. Right. But love is the most important word in my vocabulary today as a Christian. We need to protect ourselves, we need to protect our families, we need to protect our homes. 
and we need to um, fight the fight. We need to battle the battle. I um, could not live without the church in my life. I need I need an opportunity to worship. Obviously, I can worship and pray without a church, but I need the um, spiritual um, strength and fortitude that I get by participating in church. My wife and I belong to the church choir, mm. and um, we have choir, choir practice once a week, and choir practice is um, a wonderful worship opportunity because there we are um, trying to improve the quality of our worship because um, there's an old saying that a prayer sung is twice as strong as a prayer spoken. Prayers of the church, I want the prayers of other people. When, when something's going on in my life or in my wife's life, I ask people to pray for me, for us, for her. In Howard's book, he spoke a few times of suffering from depression before he encountered Christ. Deep depression is something I have endured and battled in my own life. And it is a devastating darkness upon the soul as well as the mind. It is a mercurial devastation that the author Andrew Solomon called the Noonday Demon, after a passage from Psalm 91 for which his book is named. I ask Howard to talk a little bit about how depression affected the soul which is something the medical sciences often dismiss. C.S. Lewis said one of the greatest tricks of the evil one is to get people to think that he walks around in a red union suit with a tail and horns. I, I believe in spiritual warfare and that um, God has given us a world with a lot of good, but also so that we can um, grow and learn and make choices and develop character and discern there is um, spiritual evil in the world, that which is opposed to good, so that we live in, live in a world that has um, opposing forces going on. And we, as we mature spiritually, need to know how to combat the evil forces, the demonic forces in the world, um, because they want to oppress us, they want to defeat us. Evil works in lots of ways. One of the, one of the ways is illness, one, and um, a lot of the ways is um, in um, subtle things like depression, which is um, an oppressing spirit. And these spiritual forces need to be fought spiritually. You know, Paul talks about this stuff a lot in his letters, mm. that the powers and principalities that we're fighting against are spiritual, they're not real. Mm. And so there's people, there's demonic beings, there's evil spirits, forces that will be um, trying to destroy you. And what, what a great tool to send a spirit of oppression on you, to put you into a, a, a depression is, is um, really um, wonderfully destructive um, form of oppression because when you become depressed, um, you even isolate yourself. You don't want, you don't even seek help. I mean, and it's, depression is very common. Often in life, we resort to a natural instinct to overcome circumstances with stronger, faster, smarter responses to that which we want to control. It struck me as interesting that when Howard was in his hellish state, that no chance of rescue even occurred to him or was offered to him until he was so stripped of strength that he had no ability or even will left to offer opposition. I asked him if he considered that the only way to be ready for Christ and his love was through the destruction of his own ego and strength and to submit to a rescue that could only come from God and His grace and power, and not that of our own choice or will. I see the experience as having my um, 
ego consciousness, my defensiveness, um, attacked and destroyed. So I see it as a great gift. And um, people in AA tell me that the only way that an alcoholic is ever going to seek help, seek sobriety, is when they hit the gutter. When <laughs> everything that they've been trying, which is a strategy to protect yourself. I mean, that's why people become alcoholics, is it's a way of... Um, and that's, uh, alcohol is an anesthetic. Mm -hmm. And you take the anesthetic to protect yourself, to try and protect yourself from pain. The pain of life being hurt. Um, when at some point you finally realize it's a disaster and it's not working at all, then you like begin to think maybe God might be a better solution than um, being intoxicated. The, the metaphor that I used was when I was a kid, I, I liked knights. You know, when I was a little boy, I used to make armor with cover cardboard with aluminum foil and, you know, dress up like a knight and stuff like that. Um, so the way I, the metaphor I use is I see myself as a child um, building a suit of armor around myself of ego, of control, of independence, of indifference to other people. And the problem is, is that as you grow, the armor doesn't grow. The, the defense mechanisms that you've developed to protect yourself against emotional pain don't grow with you, so you end up um, responding inappropriately to life. Because ultimately what life is um, should be about and could be about is being open to the whole world as much as possible without losing, um, completely losing your mind. Um, so allowing um, other people's experience to be your experience, allowing God to be God and to inform you and to direct you, um, giving up a lot of control and being selective about what you um, defend yourself against. In other words, instead of being highly selective about what you let in, just the opposite, being highly selective about what you don't allow yourself to let in and becoming more and more empathetic so the, the way that we open ourselves up is one, by um, looking at our traumas, our fears, our terrors, our anxieties, and looking at all that stuff and looking at where it came from. If we don't, it's just going to control us. It's just going to run our lives. So it's a matter of wanting to make a choice, and the, ch and the choice is to... Um, um, look into ourselves and particularly look into the um, scary, shadowy places that we don't want to look at and deal with those things. And the other thing is to put uh, faith, hope, and trust into something other than ourselves. A lot of it has to do with um, being self-analytical Interestingly, I have kind of found people fall into two categories. There's people that are interested in being um, analytical about their lives and themselves, and there are people that avoid it like a plague. Mm. And there are some people that have seem to lack, completely lack any insight into themselves because they don't choose to go there. They don't want to look. They're, in a way, they're afraid of what they're going to find. Like there's some... I had a friend of mine who once told me there's a big monster inside of me, and if I ever went and looked at it, it would destroy me. And I tried to tell him, I said, you know that big scary monster that's inside of you? It's a phantom, and if you ever looked at it, it would turn into a puff of smoke and disappear. Death is something that most of us fear. Some fear it to the point of a living paralysis of enjoying God's gifts of life and learning. What encouragement would Howard have for those who fear death? In the mission work that I did, um, one of my good friends down there, who's a guy who um, spent a lot of his life involved in the drug trafficking business and made money, he's a Belizean guy, 
a um, guy that I love very much. He's no longer involved in that stuff. Um, he told me one day, he said, you know, you're in danger every day you're down here. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, everybody knows you have money in your pocket. And he said, there's people down here that don't care that you're a pastor. They don't care that you're trying to help people. He said, um, there's people down here that um, want the money in your pocket. And they would think nothing of um, coming up behind you and shooting you in the back of the head or slitting your throat um, for what's in your wallet. And he said, uh, you need to be careful. And I said, well, you know, I, I, I do try and be careful. I try and be reasonable. But I said, you know, I can't, I can't live in fear. I choose not to live in fear. Um, so I guess I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. And if they want to kill me for what's in my wallet, um, be my guest because I have nothing to lose. I said, you know, I said, you know, anybody that kills me is sending me home. Um, and so if I die, I win. If I live, I win. So I'm in a I'm I'm in a win-win situation because I don't have I, I don't have any fear of death, and also I trust God. According to what I've read, the number one fear in the world is fear of death, and it's really an important topic because um, I think that people are not only um, have a tremendous fear of death, but I think that they really mess up their lives and their opportunity to experience life because of their fear of death so that they seek um, substitutes for life and the hope that they can avert death somehow um, so that they have um, inauthentic lives to get people to know who they are who God is and what the relationship between us and God is, is the anecdote to fear of death. Um, Jesus did what he did um, as God's ultimate display of why we should not fear death. Jesus embraced death. He didn't just embrace death. He, he embraced the worst death that his world knew could be inflicted on another human being. You know, um, Christ on the cross has become so common that people don't think too much about it. But Roman, the Roman Empire was really into killing people. Matter of fact, it was their um, really primary form of mass entertainment was um, all kinds of um, strange and unusual ways to destroy it, to kill people. He allowed himself to be murdered and then said, guess what? Um, I am more powerful than any of this stuff, and I offer you eternal life in his resurrection. This is not what you need to fear. In the past few years, I have read many books and particularly enjoyed several movies that were centered around our true place in the universe and God's plan. As someone who got to experience Christ, the angels, and the afterlife firsthand, I wondered how many Howard thought were accurate and did a good job of relaying God's love and desire for our lives. I particularly enjoyed the book, The Shack, by William P. Young, and wondered what his unique perspective was of it. Oh, I thought it was delightful. I think that the person who authored that did a really great job of challenging a lot of uh, Christians in their traditional thinking and presenting God as a uh, black woman who loved to cook and stuff like that. I mean, I thought that was, that was really great stuff. And, and, and anything that makes people think about God in a positive way, um, which I think that book thoroughly does, is funny that um, some people were offended by it and was like, oh, get over it. As a filmmaker, I love great films as well on this topic. I mentioned the Robin Williams film, What Dreams May Come, and the old Richard Dreyfuss John Goodman movie, Always 
as my personal favorites, but one movie in particular is his favorite. The 1990 Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore film, Ghost. The theme of Ghost is to love one another. I mean, that's, that's what Patrick Swayze is learning in his whole experience. Is Remember when, and bef before um, he died, when his girlfriend would say, I love you, he'd say, ditto. I mean, he couldn't even, I mean, this, she, I mean she seemed like a very adorable woman and she, he couldn't even give her the I love you back. I mean, he was so kind of like um, unable to really express his love. And then of course, after he died, it was like, he desperately wanted to communicate his love to her. Um, and that's why he was given that opportunity of hanging out for a little while basically, because the end of the movie is this beautiful near-death experience scene where he's being welcomed by all the angels um, up and away. Remember the, all yeah. the figures appearing in the light and greeting him and him, you know, leaving the world. It was a really powerful scene. I loved it. I thought that, that movie was exquisite, really fine. The Christian poet and mystic John O'Donohue defines sin not as the acts we do typically categorized as sin, but is instead a woundedness that we refuse to let God heal. Then poison comes from those wounds. Every day we struggle with how to rid ourselves of our failures and inadequacies in dealing with sin. It is a constant frustration of mine, and I ask Howard how we can allow God to heal us. I tell people all the time, and I do it myself, I, I visually imagine myself handing stuff to Jesus. My anger, my frustration, my weariness, my um, laziness, my, my hopes that aren't going to be met. You know, um, we were talking earlier about like the mission, my mission work and how I hope someone was going to lay hundreds of thousands of dollars on me and it never happened. And so, I mean, I've, I've accomplished something in my worship, mission work, haven't accomplished one hundredth of what I imagined I could have done if only, if only, if only, if only, if only, if only, if only which never, it didn't happen and it's never going to happen. Um, anyways, I just give every, I give um, everything over to them. Um, I give him my badness, I give him my madness, I give him my gladness, I give him everything. I mean, you know, it's like, okay, I got problems, I'm imperfect here, Jesus, take it all, you know. I, I'm dumping the whole stinking mess of my life in your capable arms, and it all belongs to you, and I'm just going to proceed to do the best that I can with what I got. Um, and I hope that I, and I hope that Jesus knows that um, I totally appreciate him, and uh, I am in my uh, clumsy best, um, fumbling along, trying to uh, follow what I think um, would please him. I don't, I don't do stuff because it's going to win his favor or it's going to win me points or it's like the price of the ticket home. Not, it's not that. Not, that's not the motivation. It's just that I like him a lot. He likes me a lot and I want to please him. You know, like um, I like my wife and I do things to please her. And you know what? Um, some of the things that I do to please her aren't things that I particularly want to do. Like I gotta go around the house and empty all the trash cans today and put the trash out because tomorrow's trash day. And you know what? I really don't get a kick out of doing the trash, but I'm gonna do it because um, <laughs> it's a good thing to do, but I also know that it pleases her to have to see the trash emptied, you know, and have the trash taken out. And she works hard and she doesn't really need to be the I, you know, I do that. Um, I'm making dinner for my uh, grandson's tonight and my wife and stuff like that. And, um, I enjoy that, but I do it, you know, I, I've told my grandsons, you know, I've said to them, my words, you know why I do this? Because I love you and I want you to know that. And by making these meals, I hope you understand it's my way of showing that I loved you. Do you get it? And they go, yeah, we know, Grandpa. And I'm like, okay, I just want to make sure that you understand why you come over here on Monday night and eat. I want you to understand why you're doing that, you know? You know, that's it. That's the, the I like being around you. My time with Howard came to a close. We had already exceeded the time allotted for the interview, and I wanted more. 
I could have spent all day with him and came away wishing I could do more to tell people about his amazing experience and share his wisdom with a deeply wounded and troubled world. His book, My Descent into Death, A Second Chance at Life, is available in bookstores and on Amazon in both print and Kindle versions and explores his experience and new life in greater detail. I hope these interviews have given the viewer some perspective, hope, and motivation to both give and receive love that is our proper destiny and calling.